Hey there, hi and howdy everybody, it's your boy JRG, good morning from downtown San Antonio. Uh, we're back again with another episode of the Geekdom Underground Podcast. Geekdom Underground Podcast, that's right. Good morning everybody, my name is Philip Hernandez, COO here at Geekdom. Super excited for our Geekdom Underground Podcast episode today. We have Luciano Oviedo from Tempugo, a startup out of the Bay Area, California. Coming all the way to San Antonio, Texas, also a participant in the residency. So awesome. Very awesome to have you here, Luciano. How are you? Doing well. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're stoked. Thank you for coming down here and and participating with us. Um, So, you know, we like to keep things really chill and conversational down here. So Mm -hmm. um, my first question for you is where you're from. How'd you get here? Yeah, well, actually, ironically enough, I am from San Antonio. Really? Yeah, so I was nice. born and raised here, uh, and then I graduated and then went to university at Wisconsin, where I did engineering, undergrad, graduate school, and eventually ended up in a lot of places, but California. And so, yeah, so I'm happy to be back and participate in the CIF Tech SA residency. It's been a great experience. So, hey, yeah. yeah. So. so, when's the last time you were living in San Antonio? Ooh, that's been a while, I'd say. Oh, man. Well, I hadn't actually been able to visit for a while. I mean, my folks still live here. Yeah. And uh, because of COVID and all that yeah, jazz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'd say lived here for probably at least like 15 years. You know? Really? So it's been, you know, I've lived a lot of different places. I've lived all over the Western Hemisphere. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. South, Central America, North America, you know. So you just yeah. moved around all yeah, over the place. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Is yeah. that because of work or? Yeah, you know, fortunately, um, I kind of had the ability to blend uh live and work abroad uh and so i worked in you know various countries and studied in different countries it it initially started off as study abroad programs oh nice uh and then eventually expanded to to job and so you know it's really interesting cultural experience being able to you know see different parts of you know south central america and so i think it's really kind of fueled my mindset around seeing the uh, you know, I guess what I work on in terms of products and solutions from different people's perspective, you know, different cultural perspectives, yeah, uh, different historical context perspective, just the whole like seeing the world from somebody else's point of view. And so that was a kind of a great motivator and kind of in a way uh, kind of launching myself into that uh, that point, that way of looking at how to create products and services. Yeah. So yeah. tell let's let's start there. Like, let, why don't you tell us a little bit about Tempugo? Yeah, so Tempugo is um, it's kind of an interesting beast. It's a it's a hybrid what we call action research product services organization, and so we create technologies and products and services like you know any regular other organization. But what we try to do uh, that's different is really infuse it with this notion of action research, which comes from uh, you know, a, a different stream, by the way, I'm kind of all, uh, finishing my doctorate. And so my whole research is on the social impact of emerging technologies. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And so I was already kind of, uh, on this theme around how do we as decision makers in organizations, whether you're a startup or a multinational navigate and, 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 and grapple and, eventually arrive at what decision to make given this tension between this emerging new technology innovation and its plausible impact in society before you deploy it. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. that kind of lent itself to, well, if I'm going to work on uh, startups and technologies, I wanted to comprehend that mindset. And so uh, what we do there, um, and in fact, any or any startup that I'm involved with, and I'm I'm involved with many um, in different roles that, it's applying, infusing it with this action research rigor based off this intersection of design thinking, uh, user-centered design, uh, strategic or what we call open strategy. And so really, which means you democratize the process for how to think about a problem or a, a pain point and therefore the solutions to it. It's not just like, okay, well, this one stakeholder, you know, you solve for them, but you solve for the stakeholders around them as well yeah so for example okay you're my customer but i'm also going to design it so perhaps your suppliers or your partners or your customers customers so you kind of take this expanded view and in fact we bring them into the process 
hey, what do they see as uh, the pain point in this particular event, for example? And so yeah. uh, this notion of bringing action research is pretty novel. Uh, it's not common because it does take kind of an extra kind of capability from people. Yeah. So we all have a mixed uh, methods background, technologists, engineers, social scientists, data science. So we kind of have a very eclectic mix of talent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, just engineers per se. Right on. What is action research? Yeah. So action research is kind of a, so historically research per se is kind of more like the creation of knowledge uh -huh. fundamentally in the physical sciences. It's like, let's go and discover something new that we didn't know about using things like science and physics and mathematics mm -hmm. in the social sciences. It's a little different because you deal with humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so the idea behind action research is that yes, it's still discovering, but the way one discovers is different. It's you go into the organization, you're embedded and that, that becomes the notion of ethnographic research. You're living with the organization that you're, not just observing, but you're uh, implementing what we call interventions. Like, oh, a new way to think, a new way to solve a problem, a new way to behave. Yeah. And then you're comparing it with what was done before and you're learning and co-adapting with the organization. And so change is not just like, okay, here's the thing you do and then you go do it. Uh, or I'm just observing, this is what I observed and here's the learnings. Action reaches is kind of that intersection is I am in there with you, uh, learning and developing what is next. And we implement it together, learn together. And from the quote, research side, we create insights and learnings that has rigor behind it. And then from the organization, you're implementing something new, transforming from what you were to what's next. Yeah. So the output of that kind of research, is that just like bringing in fresh eyes and showing like new perspectives or what's the, what would be the benefit that like, if somebody like myself, like I hadn't used that term before, mm -hmm. um, what would be the benefit of, of doing action research within your organization? Yeah. So, um, some of the benefits, so if you think about the comparison, for example, consulting, mm -hmm. right? So an organization can bring in consultants to, in a way, do the same thing, come in, observe, make recommendations, implement it. The thing that's different about action research, it's with a lens of creating new knowledge as well. And so you not only help the organization solve a problem, get better by some measure, let's say, you know, they are faster, they are better, they are cheaper or whatever measure you want to use. Mm -hmm. And then there's permutations of that, like, okay, now we are more lean or now we are more agile or now we have a new strategy for whatever. Um, yes, that is part of it. But what the additional complementary part of action research is, is to create new knowledge. Hey, this is how this kind of organization was able to learn how to behave differently. That becomes part of the body of knowledge for the world of, you know, let's say the domain, we'll call it strategic management. So now in strategic management, we'll take these cases that were implemented in these different organizations and we'll say it's now part of the new body of knowledge for strategic management research or whatever domain it is. And so yeah. it's not just kind of helping them implement and be better, faster, cheaper or different, but it's also about how can we do it in a way that creates new knowledge that adds to how do we think about what it means to be competitive? How do we rethink what win means? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the variation. And so that benefit to the organization who participates is, oh, they get to learn mm -hmm. as well. It's about not just, okay, higher performance, let's say financially, but it's like, oh, we, th we now think differently about who we are as an organization and why we are. Yeah. And we're not just, okay, implementing whatever our thing is, but we're part of the contributors for how all of their organizations are gaining understanding about what it means to be an organization. So they are part of this collection of growing the body of knowledge, so to speak. Wow. Yeah. So, so when you go into an organization and you're performing the action research, um, are they, is the organization brought into the fold as well to like help with that research? 
um, because like like for your example, when you bring in a consultant, consultant will come in, they'll provide their knowledge to make you better, and yep. then they leave. Yep. With this action research, if I'm tracking it right, it sounds like um, you would come in as the action researcher, bring them into the fold to understand the reasoning behind your research, and then they would then have the knowledge to continue doing that research. So not not so with a consultant, you might have to bring them in again mm -hmm. a few quarters from now to do this again or to make it better. Mm -hmm. But with action research, you've learned this new knowledge on how to um, how to make your company better or your process or whatever it is that you mm -hmm. want to work on, and then you can continue to do it yourselves mm -hmm. after that. And then you, as the action researcher, have more knowledge to then help the next client in strategic management or something or whatever it is that y'all are looking into and other companies too. Yeah. Yes. Is that right? Yep. The short answer is yes and no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it, 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 it's not uniform, right? It's a spectrum. I got so you. For example, um, I worked on an NSF program where it was a spectrum of organizations and each one was implemented differently. And so it really depends on the organization you know, what capacity, what motivation, uh, ideally, yes, you yeah. know, they are seeking to that. And that is the intent uh -huh. is to be able to hand off this capability and then they nurture and grow it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so, you know, but you get all the spectrum. So, uh, my belief is that the organization of the future, uh, should aim to at least have some capacity to be able to do this. And so, because, um, what we're seeing in the literature is that the highest performing organizations are the ones that are open to learning perpetually. Mm -hmm. And it's not about like, okay, what we do and how well we do it, but is how fast do we learn about how to do the next thing? Yeah. Because nothing's static. And so it's this learning mindset, this growth mindset, which kind of feeds into this is a key way of being able to do that. It's like, how do we perpetually relearn and learn and teach each other and that's where this kind of activity comes into play yeah now that you, now that you say that it does make sense because i'm trying to think about it if we were to bring something like that like a an action researcher into our organization at geekdom yeah we would have to have somebody with that capacity to continue that yeah. to like some sort of a researcher or analyst or something on staff yeah who would follow yeah. the process and continue wow. yeah i mean the big comp i mean what i've seen what i've observed definitely the multinationals have that capability and they call yeah. it different things um so for example at intel where i was a prior uh you know they had you know definitely like a research uh division mm -hmm. and within there you know they had a variety of different kinds of research uh and so the notion of action research was kind of it it was even different flavors within that and so i it, most big companies have a huge research division and so it's just a matter of do they focus on content you know, IOT, AI, whatever, mm -hmm. or do they focus on process? Um, and so that's more the realm of action research. It's kind of this interplay between content and process. We explore these new spaces in a certain way that creates new content, new knowledge. And so um, it can take various forms. Uh, I've seen it in the form of like user experience research, even though it's kind of focused typically on content, but there's flavors in there of like, Hey, let's go and explore how people are thinking differently about the relationship with technology. Let's say, uh, given these constraints, whether it's, let's say, socioeconomic, uh, geopolitical. And so you can kind of quickly slice something that's supposed to be like user experience research, the ability to adopt, adopt whatever technology into this other adjacent frame, such as, well, what does this mean for the role of technology for these kinds of constraints? And that turns into like new knowledge that is shared with the, the academic community. How did you get into action research? Yeah. So, um, I mentioned, uh, my role prior at Intel. Uh, so I, I was fortunate that in that role I was able to navigate, I guess, different tours of duty across many different groups. And it was in that role or in that process that I started to see patterns of different ways of making decisions. And so that's what eventually led me to leave to pursue a doctorate, to really kind of think about, well, how do 
different kinds of people make decisions given different kinds of uncertainty. And what I especially started to see is, was there's this uh, constraint in the ability to make do certain kinds of analysis. And so in particular with high uncertainty situations, so for example, the easy one is like, okay, well, autonomous vehicles. Okay, well, there's certain ethical implications like, well, who's liable if the vehicle hits somebody? Mm-hmm. Is it the car <laughs> or is it that <laughs> programmer of the algorithm? Yeah. Uh, yeah. is, you know, who, who's, who's liable legally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, and then you can kind of just expand that, right? So they also have all these sensors. Okay. So who owns the data that those sensors are collecting? Is it the car? Is it the service that is telling the car what to do? Um, is it the city or what, you know, is it the individual? And so these notions, these un, un, uh, open questions around the interplay between a technology and innovation and its interaction with society is kind of what led me to think, well, the really we really don't have the analytical frameworks or techniques or tools to to figure it out, to get our brain around it. Everybody, the, at least in my, my navigation through these business units, which included other companies as well in Silicon Valley, was like, well, we all think it's important, but we really don't know what to do about it. So that kind of became what my research was about how to help people figure it out. And the, what I found in going into that stream, right? I, I, I'm still interested in building and creating technologies. I found that this notion of action research was kind of that good intersection of being able to harness and invent some ways like analytical rigor and apply analytical rigor, rigor that's typically associated with you know research and kind of that world along with being useful and valuable. And so that's that's what kind of led me to arrive at that kind of activity as one of the many activities to be able to do that, you know, create new knowledge and yet create something that people would want and yeah. find valuable. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. What a I mean that that's such a cool concept and especially your journey to get there. Um is that is like the the idea and um like I guess, industry of action research. Is that a new thing or is that something that's been around? Uh, It's, it's kind of been around in different ways. Uh, It's still very nascent. Uh, It's, it started to, it has started to grow more, um, especially in the design uh, organizations. Yeah. Like IDEO, Frog, um, those big design groups who use already kind of this notion of design thinking. And they use this notion of ethnographic user experience field research already to explore the desires or the feasibility, the viability of uh, and the desirability of products and services. And so what I've seen is that they've really started to adopt, well, why not, you know, layer on this knowledge creation component? And so that's kind of manifesting itself. And so I, be, I see a trend there that it is growing. And then I see a lot of, uh, uh, and I don't know if it's a Bay Area thing, but I definitely see like universities taking that on, like, hey, we're gonna implement this action research uh, component to our curriculum. Uh, and so that's also where I'm seeing it as well. So I'm seeing it in design organizations, university curriculum, and then, you know, there's like startups like that I work on, which are kind of what we call purpose-driven social impact startups. And we really kind of try to integrate rigor, academic rigor into what we're doing in a deliberate way so that we are, you know, ideally we would produce a product and a paper at the same time. You know, so that's kind of an example of a deliverable. Yeah. Hey, so here's a product feature, download it. Um, and then by the way, here's a conference presentation on a paper that talks about the, let's say, existential trade-offs of people interacting with technology in this new way. Oh, wow. So Yeah, that's intense. Especially, you know, I wonder what kind of research um, is going to be done on these last like 18 months when a lot of folks who maybe hadn't leaned into the benefits of newer technologies, like even things like video conferencing, um, who were now like forced to kind of do that in order to continue working. I bet there's going to be some, some really insightful research that comes out of this. Yeah, there's, um, 
there's a re how should I say a rebooting of our assumptions. <laughs> and so, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, like, what does it mean to be productive? Uh, what yeah. does it mean to uh, interact and, and build relationships? Yeah. Uh, what does it mean to, uh, you know, launch a team? Like, you know, the mm-hmm. traditional notion of like storming, norming, performing for a team yeah. of like, but how do you, does that still apply in a virtual world? Right. Onboarding uh, and, <laughs> and uh, even things like, what does a work day look like? Yeah. Like we're so used to that rigid nine to five schedule. That's right. But, you know, now with people going remote, Oh, yeah. I mean, things have changed. Like maybe people aren't morning people and they're, they're, yeah. they get more, they're more productive in the evening hours. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that I'm not an action researcher, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I yeah. have noticed that, you know, I've seen um, more folks move towards like a, a workload mentality versus like a time clock oh, yeah. mentality, you know, where I have to put in 40 hours instead yeah. of thinking of it that way. It's like, these are the deadlines that I have to exactly. hit. Exactly, the this, deliverables. Yeah, so, yeah. man, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so you went to high school here in San Antonio. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah, I uh, grew up on the south side, went to South San Antonio. Right on. Uh, and, Represent? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it had been a while. I was like, well, where is that? I want to go visit, see what's going on, you know? And yeah. So, uh, I couldn't do it this time, but next time I emailed a couple of math and science. Where I was like, hey, you know, I can come by and talk to your class. And, oh, and that's STEM so careers. cool. Yeah, and, that's yeah. really cool. Um, so, so growing up in the South side of San Antonio, did you have aspirations of becoming a a researcher? What did you want to do? Especially, especially, um, knowing that it it sounds like you left San Antonio right after high school. Yeah. Um, so what was on, what were you thinking? What was on the horizon for you? Um, yeah, I think pretty early on, I was very, I guess back then it wasn't really called STEM per se. It was just like, Hey, you know, here's the engineering. And I actually participated in what's called uh magnet high school. It was, um, I can't even remember the name, but it was, uh, at, at, uh, San Antonio, uh, community college. Oh, right and on. they would like bus people from all over the city mm-hmm. to yeah. just do math and science. And, uh, but I knew pretty early on that was my trajectory, you know, it was going to be engineering, math, physics. So. Uh, yeah, it was just a good launching pad for going to that magnet school. And then, you know, I actually initially started in astrophysics and then, you know, transitioned into electrical and computer engineering. Um, and so it was always kind of, I think for me, and I was kind of joking with a colleague earlier, uh, who was visiting from Austin and, uh, uh, John Minor, if you're out there, listen to this, uh, we were, (laughs) we were, we were joking that, uh, you know, the influence of Star Trek, you know, yeah. on the, the, on engineers it has been huge. Right. And so we're like, we're thinking of uh, starting a paper, speaking of action research on the relationship between Star Trek and strategy and just kind of, you know, analyzing, you know, to what extent did the concepts in this content, you know, through, you know, this franchise called Star Trek, the influence that it had on, on people who wanted to study space or engineering Mm -hmm. Um, because it has, I mean, if you go to NASA or any of those, you know, organizations, all those guys and gals, uh, Trekkies, Trekkies, they're all like, Oh, they can quote, you know, a series (laughs) or whatever. Right. And so, uh, it is kind of, uh, it hasn't been studied or there is, I mean, cause not, why would somebody think about that? Right. Yeah. But but back to what you asked about kind of inspiration, I would say the kind of, that was an interesting indirect inspiration was kind of being exposed to that and just being surrounded by people are like, and to be honest, it wasn't, it's not common. I think when I started undergrad, it's, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's probably still not easy, but I remember when I started in undergrad, I think there was like 30 people from San Antonio that we all kind of ended up meeting each other because you know, we all had never lived anywhere outside the city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like, we just didn't, we, nobody had ever traveled or li- nonetheless lived. Yeah. And only like two of us graduated out of those 30. Really? Yeah. Oh, so there were 30 up there yeah, at the university. Yeah, people that left from oh, wow. San Antonio as high school graduates. Wow. That we just kind of discovered our, each other and only two ended up graduating. Why Why but, in that university in particular? Um, I don't know. Uh, it, yeah, I think there was maybe a recruitment. I don't know. Something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Uh, but, you know, I guess compared to other, like UT Austin, that's like nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like 30,000. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. What uh, university was 
Wisconsin. Oh, University, oh, of, Wisconsin. University of Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, Madison. So. Wow. Yeah, so right. if there's any Badgers out there, hello, <laughs> what's up? Badgers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, in fact, yeah. University of Wisconsin Badger. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got yeah. the Badger. Bring him in. <laughs> nah, yeah. that's, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, and what was it about University of Wisconsin that, that made you want to go there? Um, to be honest, it was financial. Yeah. <laughs> they, sure. like, yeah. they gave a scholarship or better scholarship that was than the somewhere one. else. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it was like, you know, financial. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I got accepted to different universities um, that I actually wanted to go more but I couldn't afford it. And so for me, it was purely like, Hey, you know what? They gave the best scholarship. So that's yeah. where I'm going to go. Are you happy with your decision? <laughs> I am. I am. It's, it you know, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't, I, well, I, I was, like I said, looking at astrophysics, physics, mm-hmm. you know, and then when I got there, it's like, Oh, whoa, this is engineering. I didn't know that. And so they have a really good engineering and mathematics department. And so that was like the Lego or the building block for kind of just, Hey, I mean, really phenomenal engineering yeah. program and so it, yeah it's funny right how like you know you don't really at least in my high school experience you don't really get exposed to like um like you can be an engineer or like you can be an astrophysicist or like yeah you yeah. know what i mean so yeah i mean you don't they don't talk i mean at least when i was around they didn't talk about like here's the plausibilities yeah i yeah. think that would be so useful like yeah just i mean not that you have to decide but at least it motivates you like oh Oh, that's yeah. a realistic thing that yeah. I could do. Like, that's, that's not right. just that's not just a show. That's, that's right. not just yeah. Star Trek. Like, <laughs> that's I, right. That's I right. can actually yeah. look into teleportation or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that I, I met people that that's what they wanted. I was like, what? You're actually just going to major in this so that you can figure it. I was like, yeah. And I was like, whoa, that's so uh, interesting. So it was a uh, pretty, uh, I guess, aspirational in that yeah. sense. So engineering is what it was. That yeah. was your path whenever yeah. you were at University of Wisconsin. Yep. Um, and then you finished, you graduated from there. Yep. Assuming. That's where you got your undergrad. Mm-hmm. And then where'd you go from there? Yeah, so I kind of, I, I stuck around. I, um, I, I worked in uh, embedded systems engineering after that. Um, in fact, that was kind of ironic because uh, uh, I was getting recruited to come back to Texas, go to California with these mega big companies. And I was like, nah, you know, kind of want to, you know, I, I, I kind of like hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I just want to hang out some more. Yeah. And uh, so I, I ended up taking a, a, a job with this local company. And uh, the interesting part was that I was hired on to do uh, a one role, but then uh, it, not after soon, I started working there while I was, before I graduated, like a semester to kind of get me uh, onboarded. mm mm-hmm. And then as soon as I graduated and started working there, the the VP who hired me left. And then they were like, oh, well, we think we're going to have to put you in a new role. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I just kind of like turned on these other offers. And uh, and then I got put into a hardcore, serious engineering role. And I was like, I don't know if I really wanted to do that. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, but you yeah. know what? For two years, they kicked my butt in like hard core serious engineering i mean really like i had taken the classes i had done the labs you know to get the degree but this was like serious this is real this was i was like oh my god and uh, they didn't go over this in class yeah Yeah. (laughs) totally i mean this was like (laughs) badgers yeah (laughs) Yeah, exactly like can i just hang out (laughs) and and so at first i was like oh man you know but then after a while i was like hey this is kind of interesting yeah and um after about two years of like this, um, I don't know, Navy SEAL training and engineering, like it, it, it just kind of clicked. And I was like, oh, I got this. And I figured it out. And so um, that engineering training was so valuable that it's still relevant today. Like, really? Yeah, we were working on like just crazy networking technologies that like yeah. was making satellites talk to base station controllers, moving video and data packets. It was all like... Wow. What's called I well so right now we're in this transition between what's called IPv4 Internet version four to IPv6, which is kind of prioritized packets. You can control the quality of service, and so you might notice that, and if you're really into your tech, that you, you, there's different IP addresses and different routing, and and so this technology was invented back then, and it's just kind of been slowly rolled out from governments to the public. 
Wow. And so this stuff was like all kind of the things that I got thrown <laughs> That's into. That's a mind. So yeah. you, you were on like the cutting edge. Yeah. And like literally like these companies were inventing the fiber optics for how to make these things talk to each other all around the world. Wow. And, you know, so, you know, it was interesting because then after that, I was like, okay, well now I'm going to go to grad school. And then it's like, I haven't had to retool my tech thing because it's, kind of still playing out yeah you know i mean of course i've learned i've gone there's this idea of this uh uh in europe they call it the osi seven layer stack from like mm-hmm. the hardware layer to the presentation where it's kind of like the framework for how all technology telecommunications talks to each other mm-hmm. around the world it's the standard so i basically got a boot camp from that this first few layers on how like the entire internet works yeah and will ever work <laughs> yeah, basically yeah. it's the foundation yeah, it's of the foundation the internet yeah they're not gonna change it for a while um and so then it was just a matter of adding layers on top of that stack and that's what i went to grad school for and i went to go work at intel just like okay learning how to build and implement those different layers and so by the time i left intel i had already kind of worked my way through the whole stack yeah and it was like oh well this is how the world of telecommunications works anywhere yeah and it doesn't matter which company was yeah. was Intel the next step after this company that you were with? Uh, so after that company, I went back to grad school, and then after grad school, then I went. Then to you Intel. went to Intel. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about that time because it sounds like it was a really challenging time in your life um, to to be in a good way, but it was yeah. challenging the things that you know you. I don't want to say came easy to you, but you were comfortable with that that kind of STEM curriculum and, yeah. and that cadence. But then when you get into the real world, it's totally different. And yeah. now your your pay depends on it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. So how did you get through that? Um, you know, I don't know. I think it comes down to a few variables like personal motivation, yeah, yeah tenacity. But yeah. it's the stuff that I don't think they teach, right? Like, you know, it's kind of like you may or may not indirectly get it from your peers or family. Um, but I think it's actually value, valuable enough of a curriculum. Like, hey, how do you teach someone to be tenacious? Yeah. You know, to have fortitude, right? Yeah. Like, like, we don't talk about that in mm-hmm. curriculum. It's just like, okay, here's the structure, here's the grades. And kind of the assumption is, is that, you know, you somehow get these things that will guide you in your path and your trajectory. Yeah. But I think those are important enough things that like, you know, they should be a thing. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I, cause this is me reflecting back and I think it was those kinds of variables Yeah, that was like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to pers- you know, persist through. Um, and it was also kind of this, uh, intrigue with the, with the, with the content. It's, you know, if, if I, I believe if one has natural curiosity, this career, that, that, that kind of content lends itself to curiosity because yeah. there's so many things to discover. Um, you know, even if you're like into the mathematics, it's like, wow, this is, you know, it can be beautiful from some perspective. Right. And then when you apply it, it's like, oh, very practical. It's called engineering. You apply the mathematics. Yeah. Um, and, and, oh, the theory behind it is the physics. Oh, and so you kind of have these, these subjects that, you know, if you're curious, there's lots to discover. Um, so I think that was another thing is, uh, you know, just having this natural curiosity, just being curious and, um, always being challenged to solve a problem. I think that's another thing. Yeah. Um, I think if one finds themselves that they, uh, find themselves, uh, 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 they enjoy problem solving or solving challenges. Sometimes they don't, there's not even an answer. Mm -hmm. Um, I joke with my son that, um, there's kind of stages of thinking like, uh, undergrad or high school prepares you to uh in a sense answer questions right right but they don't really teach you how to create a question yeah Mm. how do you create a question Mm -hmm. what is a question what is the architecture of a question what does a question mean so how do you invent a question and so in high school they in a way teach you how to answer them somebody else invents them yeah and you just answer them in whatever class it is. Here's the sheet. Here's the questions. Think of the tests, mm-hmm. the filter. Oh, it's just questions. It doesn't say there isn't one that says invent your question and then answer it. And so I'm like, that's that's what they're preparing you for. Yeah. And in a way, uh, that kind of relates to the curiosity thing. Like if you find your, if one finds himself like, well, I'm not necessarily happy with just that. 
then you can, what is the fields that enable me to create my own questions? And I have found, I mean, that can be applied to any field, but I found that in STEM related, and I'm a big proponent now of art-based STEM. Mm. So it's not just about science, tech, engineering, math, which are big blobs of topics. But to me, it's about how you can pursue that by using your imagination and original thinking and creativity to explore and implement those fields. To me, that's the next frontier. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting because like in that STEM world, like things seem very binary. Like there's a, like there's an absolute answer to every question. Yep. And, but it, in, but in practice, like when you go from, um, like going to school, like in your experience, when you go from that to then going, putting it into practice and being in the real world, um, what they don't tell you is that like, there's no answer key. There's no yeah, like, yeah. there's no absolute. And That's in, right. in fact, like it's kind of like in coding, um, like in programming, you're going to be wrong a lot more times than you're right. Yeah. You're going to fail a lot more than, than you succeed, but that's part of it. It's oh, there, yeah. that struggle. So when you have that, um, and, and I understand what you're saying on that, like that breeds curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, because then you're like, well, I just, now that I figured that out, how did I get there? Why did this make, how did I not see this thing? And then it just makes you think more. Yeah. How do you, uh, how did you make that transition from like, like I, I feel like naturally I would feel like if I'm failing, then mm. I'm a failure. Yeah. But at some point you have to make that transition that like, that's not how you think. So yeah. how do you think about it? Yeah. You know, it's um like I mentioned the 30 people and two people, right. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's a huge humbling experience. Yeah. And um, I definitely need to know for like my, my, the, the other person who was a good friend of mine when we finished, like it was not easy. Um, and yeah. so failure was like, a big part of that process in different ways. Right. And I just, yeah. and so we went through all our, and so to me, I think the, and this is what I really like about startup life is that uh, we embrace failure as a win. It's like, Hey, you know what? If I'm not failing at something, then I'm not taking enough risk. Um, and so I really like that mindset. And I wish I would have learned that sooner because if like we taught, if you think all the way going down to K through 12, yeah. Kind of these seeds are being planted of what's next, promoting STEM and art based STEM is my particular thing. Yeah. Uh, like promoting art based STEM and and including in there the the mindset of, hey, you know what? Failing is not bad. Failing is good. That means yeah. that you learn something. Mm-hmm. And so rewarding failure to me is kind of the thing that needs to be the supporting environment. And unfortunately that's not a lot of systems. And so that's kind of where I see maybe the role of parents, communities, peer groups. Like if, if we can somehow infuse like, Hey, reward failure. Yeah. uh, Then I think that will lead to kind of more successful outcomes. And that's how I think about it. That's kind of how I landed for, I kind of went through it and it's like, wait a minute. I learned a lot. Yeah. (laughs) And then it's like, you know what? It's actually beneficial that, you know, I went through that. Yeah. Because then, you know, I wouldn't know as much as I knew. So that's kind of how I think about it now. Yeah. And, um, you know, and kind of connecting back to the imagination and creativity part, I think if that's another underappreciated aspect, uh, you know, art is being deleted from most school curriculums in favor of whatever, let's say even STEM, which you know, it's a, it's why, sh- why should it be a trade off in my view? Yeah. And so to me, and the reason I say it, they're equally important, in fact, art and creativity and imaginary, because once you kind of learn, you kind of see the plateaus and this is the pattern I see working in multinationals is that other parts of the world are like pouring tons of resources into the, Hey, let's teach you how to solve these questions, the math, the science, the engineering. <laughs> and but at a certain plateau, it's not about, you know, solving it. It's like, well, what is the next question we should be answering? Yeah. Well, who's going to invent the question? Mm-hmm. And that's where creativity and imagination. Yep. And I remember I was in a meeting in London 
with a bunch of, you know, doctoral colleagues and like we were practicing uh, uh, what topics we were going to be exploring. And, you know, I asked uh, all of them, you know, it was kind of a joke. It's like, well, what question are you answering? And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, I asked you what your research question is. And they couldn't even formulate the question. And I was like, what question are you answering? And so just the act of like creating a question that is novel yeah. is very challenging. And I think that's the importance of creativity and imagination. It, it allows a human to be able to kind of create a, a harness their mindset in a way that's like, when you ask the question and, or when you invent a question, it actually uh, provokes a response from those who hear it. And so to me, I'm really into kind of exploring this notion of the power of inventing questions. And it harnesses uh, the science, the engineering, the math, as well as the imagination and creativity. And, you know, to me, that's an interesting intersection because uh, I think inventing a question uh, or getting to the point where one is inventing robust, novel, uh, authentic questions, uh, original questions, then that it's going to require a lot of failure. And yeah. so that goes back to your question. It's like getting to that point is not going to be like, it's not natural because we're not taught that. Yeah. And so to me, uh, it's kind of a combination. It's like be open and willing to uh, embrace failure. And then a good way to practice that is by, Hey, what, what question can you invent? And yeah. when I say that, it's like, okay, well, well, what time is it? Or, you know, when should I go somewhere? Those are kind of like basic questions, but how do you invent a question that's never been asked before? That's crazy. That is nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Have so you blowing have, my mind? Yeah. Have you, <laughs> have you invented questions that have never been asked before? Well, that's uh, I, I try. I mean, I think yeah. you just asked me one. So my research question <laughs> is how might we account for the social impact of an emerging technology or innovation before it's deployed into a society or community? Yeah. Right. So that's kind of my question. Um, and when I looked is that that question have, hasn't ever been posed before. Yeah. And so I deemed it as a worthy to pursue and build a body of research around it. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. And I, I totally see um, the connection between having that art um, as part of the STEM. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's, it should be STEAM. Yeah, but well, STEAM, yeah, STEAM. STEAM is a thing. It, 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 it's, yeah, yeah it's STEAM a is a thing. And the reason I flipped it to art-based STEM is because um, in the medicine world, there's thing, this evidence-based medicine. So there's medicine, but then there's evidence-based medicine. And so it kind of puts an special emphasis on the, the, the rigor behind arriving at a conclusion that is now something you can recommend for a patient. Yeah. And so that's the evidence part. It's not just like, oh, I heard about it. I learned it. It's like, no, here's now I'm using this evidence that is constantly changing. So I'm using the latest evidence to make a medical decision. Yeah. So that's why... I, I kind of flipped it and said, well, art-based STEM, because then you're using the latest, greatest creativity and imagination to explore and implement STEM. Yeah. It, you, yeah. I think when I hear that, like when I heard you say that, to me, it, it um, kind of gives me, it's like a liberating feeling that like, if it's art-based STEM, then you have this like space and grace to be creative yeah. and you're not like put in this in this box That's because right. of having to calculate of having like, to calculate. Oh, I'm not a great calculator as good as them. It's like, well, that shouldn't be the point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. like we computers will do that. Yeah. yeah. Or AI will do that eventually. So what's going to distinguish you, your imagination. Yeah. And it's ir irreplaceable or in, you know, you know, AI, as far as we know, in our project, you know, foreseeable future can't imagine. Yeah. Can't be creative. Right. So if, if you're thinking even in terms of like competitive strategy of, of yourself as a human, what makes dif what differentiates me, my ability to imagine and be creative. Yeah. That's super cool. And it's, it's it giving me kind of like a Steve Jobs kind of vibes, you know, just yeah. like being creative about like technology and like how it, you know, can improve your life. And um, 
I don't know. It's just so mind boggling to me. It's super interesting too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that, totally. Yeah, that totally. was awesome. Um, so, okay. So then let, let's go back. I know we're kind of all over the place here. Totally. But, I like it. But uh, <laughs> University of Wisconsin, you went and got that job and went through like the most rigorous training of your life. Yeah. Um, and and then now, and then you went and got uh, your, then you went to graduate school. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And then you got your job at, at Intel. Yeah. What did you do at Intel? Yeah, so um, I kind of grew up as a engineer there. I went from new product development engineer to, and then I, the interesting part that I kind of led me to where I am today in some sense is I kind of worked, I mentioned I worked my way up the stack, so to speak. I went from the hardware and application, kind of just went up to the kind of notion of different technologies and how they communicate. What I started to observe when I was going into product development was that a question emerged to me back to the inventing the question is like, well, why is it that we're implementing this? Like, why not that? Yeah. Where did this decision come from? Why was this decision made to go this way or that way? And so uh, that kind of just led me to kind of the next layer was, well, let me go into, and, and what I, what I found out that was usually through something called like business and corporate strategy, which was like, these are the, I guess, uh, roles that are figuring out what we should build, why we should build it, when we should build it. Um, and so that was kind of the role that I grew into. I went from, you know, engineering to this, uh, you know, kind of business and corporate strategy role, which then I started to invent roles for myself because what I found was that within one, within one department or group or division, there was kind of a certain mindset and I was really interested in like different methods and techniques for how to uh, think about arriving and, and concluding and making a decision. And so I started to create these uh, volunteer jobs for myself with other divisions. And I literally would pitch the VP and be like, Hey, um, can we run a strategy planning session for your group to think about X, Y, Z? Uh, and so once you get the first one under your belt, it's easier to get the next one because then they're kind of your, your testimony like, oh, yeah, we had a great experience. And, and for me, it was a way of practicing uh, learning new methods and techniques for how to think about those questions. Like how do we arrive at a decision? How do we know that's the right decision? How do I really know what I really know? Right? Speaking of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was a way of practicing that. And that was another pattern that emerged is like, well, practice and learning is a capability. And so learning is a capability, the ability to learn, learning how to learn. How do you learn how to learn? Right? We're not yeah. taught that. No, yeah. And so that kind of became the prevailing pattern. I started creating these roles. I started doing these tours of duty across the organization, um, rotated through, you know, product development, business strategy, corporate strategy. Uh, marketing, finance, you name it, software, AO, uh, IoT, AI, all the different groups, all with this like, hey, how does this, how does this uh, thing called making the decision in a multinational context vary across its divisions? Because each division is basically its own company. So I basically kind of rotate it through different companies within one mega company. And so that's kind of the role that led me to think, there's a limitation in the decision making, especially with accounting to kind of this impact of this technology. And so that's what eventually led me to, well, there is no answer. Why don't I just go and invent it? And that's my research. But wow. yeah, so that was, so it's kind of a, yeah, it's not the tr typical, tr I mean, you know, I, you know, learned, did well, great experience, um, met tons of super smart great people from a, lo a lot of the world and uh, around the world. And, um, but yeah, that was my, my kind of evolution within that multinational context. And then I rotated through uh, uh, Intel capital and that was really the beginnings of like, Oh, entrepreneurship and innovation and kind of how they do it at the kind of the startup level. And yeah. then that was an even more push into the startup world. Intel capital. Is that, is that the incubator? No. So Intel capital, well, they do have one now. Okay. But it's their corporate venture capital. Mm. Oh, yeah. gotcha. So most big companies have like some venture capital arm. Yep. It's not a traditional one because traditional is like they're looking for 10, 100x or whatever it is. Uh -huh. uh, the corporate venture capital model is like, okay, well, they're 
venture capital per se. They invest in startups at different levels, but they look for what they call strategic synergy with their company. So, for example, um, in Intel's case, it's around um, are they doing things that are promoting compute, which Intel makes chips, right? They compute. So if this company succeeds, that means there's going to be a new need for compute. Mm. And therefore, that is good for the mothership. (laughs) And so they would invest in those companies. Wow. They're creating these new drivers for compute. It could be a coffee mug. It could be a car. It could be a light pole. It could be somewhere where compute doesn't happen. And so if they succeed, then, oh, more compute, more chips are needed. And therefore the yeah. mother ship makes Some, more chips. Somewhere where <laughs> compute doesn't happen traditionally. Yeah. But, yeah. but with this new That's right. startup. That I mean, it's right. like they're at the end of the day, they're making more money, but it's yeah. fostering this like, hey, let's promote innovation and yeah. creativity. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So then, um, so Intel, that was, I think you had said like 12 years. Yeah. yeah. At, at mm-hmm. Intel. Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. Um, so then after that, where'd you go from there? Yeah, that's where, you know, that was my natural evolution going into doctoral research. Um, and then that's where I've been living. And then that was a natural extension to the startup world. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm living now is research, action, action research within the startup context. So now my, my, my lens is that research question from startup versus multinational perspective. I mean, it's still the same unit, which is the individual, the, the, mm-hmm. the decision maker, the inventor, the maker, the, the, the decider. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just comparing two different contexts, the startup versus the multinational. Like, but it's, you know, if you think of the notion of a change maker, yeah. um, it's just a matter of where that change maker is. Are they in a startup, which is, own you know beast of uncertainty and context and they have to figure out their whole go-to-market interaction and whatnot or is it the multinational and within the multinational there's kind of different scenarios for example if they're a entrepreneur they're inventing let's say a new group a new technology for part of their core product line so that is kind of change maker within their space so they're kind of an internal entrepreneur Um, and then most recently um, something, for example, that Intel Capital did was launch this incubator where they uh, invest in internal startups and then, then they nurture those. And so that's kind wow. of a variation of an entrepreneur. It's yeah. kind of a hybrid intra-entrepreneur, um, still kind of protected within the umbrella, but they're like the goal is like, hey, you're going to launch and spin out kind of thing. That's sweet. Yeah. And it's- so I'm looking at this kind of people like that in that context, like how do they grapple with and navigate and, you know, assert decisions and make change? Yeah. They should have called them Intelpreneurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Hey, Trademark dude. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's up, Intel? I know yeah, they're yeah. listening. I think they're in the chat. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're yeah, like text messaging here. Yeah. You know? that's a, that one's a freebie. Um, but, uh, well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing your journey and where you've, where you've been. I bet – your research and your questions on questions, yeah. I bet you're super fun to interview with. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> for, a, for a job interview. I mean, <laughs> They'll be like, who is this guy? Yeah. Uh, I, feel like, I feel like if I left a job <laughs> interview with you, <laughs> I, would, I would be asking myself, like, who am I? Yeah, for like, sure. What? Yeah, what's my purpose? Yeah, what, yeah why do I exist? And yeah, that, that, that would be a good outcome from my perspective. Yeah. If you ask yourself, why do I exist again? Yeah, what's, <laughs> what is my question? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yes, <laughs> totally, totally. I will say uh, I really appreciate this conversation because when it started, I was like, man, I'm, I mean, the way that it progressed, I'm like, oh, okay, it makes more sense. Oh, th- that makes sense. And I feel like I have a good grasp of what it is that you're doing and what action research is and, uh, you know, how do you create a question? Like, yeah. that's... Yeah. It's yeah. really. I'm gonna be thinking about that for the rest of the yeah. day. Honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool. I, I hope so. My life. Yeah, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll leave you with one little thing that uh, uh, I think kind of uh, highlights that is uh, my my son. Uh, one day walked up to me and he's like, "Dad," I'm like, "What?" So he's like, "Can you see my question?" I was like, "What do you mean?" And he was like, "You know, little guy, like you know, one or two years old." He's like looking at me. He's like, "Can you see my question?" I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Yeah, I'm thinking a question right now. Can you see it?" And I was like, whoa, 
you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been so used to hearing <laughs> questions. Yeah. Dude, I never yeah, look a, at, see the questions. Is that That's a proud right. moment? You're like, dang, that right? blew my mind. Wow. Right? Yeah. So that, that after that, I really became fascinated with this notion. Yeah. Of, uh, That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you do like for fun? Like on your Ooh, off time. Yeah. Um, I think about questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just question yeah. reality. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I run marathons. That's, you know, one of my hobbies. Really? Yeah. So I, I like to run. Um, it's a bit a little tough in this, uh, weather in California because of, uh, wildfires and smoke. Yeah. So air quality has been a little low. And so it kind of, you know, and then the whole COVID thing, you know? Yeah. Um, that, uh, I like, uh, volunteering with nonprofits, so I'll right like just donate my time, help them with whatever thing they're doing, and so I do that as well. Um, travel is always fun. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, just uh, I guess not that uh, I don't have a lot of time just because of you know the things I'm involved with, but you know I really find my the, my the research topic that I work on uh, in a way fun. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I mean, there's a yeah. lot of fun there. And uh, I mean, because I get to meet so many people uh, from all parts of the world, kind of at different stages of their journey. Yeah. And so I guess in a way, I mean, I don't want to say it's a hobby, but it's like, it's it's so interesting. Um, I, I think it's fun, you know, and, uh, you know, being here, for example, is part of that too. So, yeah, that that's so cool. Man. I, know, I know we're running out of time uh, or yeah. getting close to time. Uh, well, how is it coming back to San Antonio? I'm sure you visit often, right? You said you had family here, but like yeah. coming back and like growing up here and having yeah. to leave San Antonio to pursue like, you know, your journey. Yeah. Um, what do you think now with like this bustling startup scene? Things yeah. happening? Yeah. You know, I'm very impressed. Um, you know, I, I hadn't been here since pre COVID. So that's, it's been a little bit of a time frame. but coming back here and kind of seeing the kind of the infrastructure and the scale out of, this emphasis on innovation and entrepreneurship is really inspiring. It's like, I'm, I'm really happy to see that. And I'm actually inspired that, Hey, you know what? Um, I think there's something, there's kind of a spark ready to, you know, ignite. And yeah. uh, I like that feeling, you know, and I think it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's almost kind of creates this and, in the startup world, it's like, okay, well, you want to create FOMO with your investors, right? And like, okay, I don't want to miss out. And so I kind of feel that a little bit like, hey, you don't want to miss out. You want to <laughs> get yeah. here and be part of it. Come so, back. Yeah, Come yeah, us. exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, before we end, um, I do want to ask, like, for those for those aspiring researchers and aspiring engineers out there, um, if you can go back to that time, um, let's say right after your undergrad and you're in that rigorous job with that training that you didn't really expect but it wasn't really unexpected for mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. um what kind of advice would you give to those that are in the, that same position or what advice would you would you have liked to heard at that time yeah i think uh my advice my guidance is that you know relish relish the burning brain cells uh Back to the learning how to learn, um, you know, the being able to be in the trenches and just being the doer, the implementer, it's, uh, they'll be, you know, you'll go through ups and downs. So my guidance is, even though it doesn't feel maybe <laughs> like it, like this is something you want to be in, uh, try to see the, the positive in it. And I heard this from a mentor of mine. He's like, it's, I think it, Think about the the phrase uh, of or if, when you leave this meeting, think about all the tasks that that you have to do. Write them down. He goes, oh, okay. He's like, now rephrase that with you get to do them, right? From have to do to get to do. You know, it's just a word change, but you know what? The mindset, yeah, is totally different. Oh, you have to kind of do this next thing. You have to do this next project. You know, you have to do this next assignment. Oh, you have to kind of do this whatever thing, uh, solve this next problem, code this next whatever. Um, you get to do that, right? That's an opportunity yeah. to learn, to grow, to essentially chart your own destiny. And so to me, that's my guidance. Rather than seeing that as have to do, see it as you get to do it and learn as much as possible when you're getting to do it 
And if you have that, you know, I recommend taking on that growth mindset, that learning how to learn mindset when you're in there in the trenches, whether it's undergrad, uh, your job or graduate school, getting to do it is, you know, I think a good way of framing the opportunity and the ability to go to that next thing and take you to that next place. Yeah, that's awesome. Just that one word change. That's right. It, it, the impact of that word. Exactly. Oh, and I get to yeah, work on this. Changing your perspective. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Well, Luciano, it, it has been a real pleasure. Thank you for coming all the way totally. from Bay City, California, just Bay Area, California. <laughs> the just, blob. The blob. Just to be <laughs> on Geekdom on Underground. That's right. Just to be here. Podcast. Yeah, the, the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the coffee alone. Well, thank you so yeah. much for, for sharing your story and your guidance and making everybody think. So, y'all, this morning, what a way to start your day. What, I love it. What is your question? Yes. So can you, you see my question? Can you, <laughs> can see, you see my see question? My question? <laughs> God, that's the, that's the one. So, Mr. JRG, if you would, sir, take us home. For sure. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the Geekdom Underground podcast. You know, it's been a lot of fun doing this. Me and Philip are learning a lot. And we get to talk to really cool people like Luciano. So, real quick before we end, how do people get to follow you? What's the website? Give yourself a plug. Yeah, uh, maybe just find me on LinkedIn. Luciano C. Oviedo on LinkedIn. And uh, happy to connect with all of you. Good to meet all of you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll have yeah. you back again once we have we figure out our question. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, have a good day, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, everybody. Ciao.